Now, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm thankful for that prayer that Andy just prayed because this is God's story and this is His book and pray that He would just speak to us today, um, what He would want us to hear. So we are finally coming to the end of the book of Jonah this morning. And hopefully you've enjoyed the trip through the book. Um, Hopefully you've enjoyed a few good laughs because it is a humorous book. There is some funny stuff in there. And hopefully maybe you've had some tears and sorrows as we've looked at the life of Jonah and recognized a little bit of Jonah in our own hearts. I hope that you've been comforted by the fact that we looked at salvation belongs to the Lord and not to us. That's a comforting fact. And maybe you've been challenged as... uh, as we've looked at our responsibility to pray, to spend time with the Lord in prayer, and our responsibility to go out and share the gospel with people who are more than likely different than us. And we really need these reminders because we live in a world that is constantly encouraging us to be like the prophet Jonah. People ruled by and driven by emotions and feelings. That's the world that we live in. I think we can all recognize that. And the world would tell you that the stronger your emotions and feelings are about a certain subject, the more true they are. And then the world would encourage you to go online and go on the internet, go on to social media, and share those feelings and emotions with the world. And those people who do not agree with you or your group are considered those people over there. You know, you can't do anything with those people over there. That's the way of the world. We're constantly encouraged to have an us versus them mentality in this world. But here in the book of Jonah, we get an up close and personal look at that quality or those qualities in a person. And we're, they're contrasted with the character of God. And we see just how ugly those qualities are in a person. Jonah is nothing like the God that he says he worships. He's nothing like him at all. Jonah has no room for compassion that are, for people that are not like him at all. Whereas our God has great compassion, so much that he stepped down from heaven to come to this earth, to become like people that were nothing like him, so that we could be saved. And this is what Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians. Remember Paul said this, he said to the weak, I became as weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. He said, and this is the heart of the Christian. Not Jonah's heart. This is the heart of the Christian. We have been saved. We have experienced God's mercy. And we want other people to experience that mercy as well. And so we go out to them to share that mercy with them. And to that kind of attitude, that kind of response to that, Jonah says, no way. He says, I am nothing like these people and I don't want to be anything like these people. Not at all. He says, I am superior to them. That's his attitude. And if they want to know about God, they can come to me. That's the heart of Jonah. That's what we've been looking at. And I bet Jonah would have been quite happy to sit, bu- sit back and have the Ninevites come groveling to him to find out more about the true God the God of heaven and earth. I can imagine that Jonah probably saying to himself, that's what should be happening here. Doesn't God know who he's talking to? Doesn't God know who I am? I'm a Hebrew. I'm an Israelite. I'm one of the chosen people of God. They should be coming to me. That's what should be happening here. So I think it would have made Jonah perfectly happy to sit and wait for them to come to him seeking his favor and to learn about God. But to go to them, that was unthinkable to Jonah, unthinkable. And if you remember, this was the mindset of the Pharisees as well, wasn't it? What did they say about Jesus when he sat down and ate with tax collectors and sinners? They were scandalized. He's eating with tax collectors and sinners. That's what they said. And so we can see the spirit of the Pharisees in Jonah, Long before the Pharisees ever came on the scene. And a matter of fact, at this point in his life, I bet Jonah would have been quite happy to be associated with the Pharisees. They were a lot like him. A lot like him. They were held in high regard, not only by the people, but by themselves. 
they saw themselves as holy and unblemished by sin. And not only that, they also opposed the mercy and compassion that God had towards people who were not like them, just like Jonah, exactly like Jonah did. If you remember one day when Jesus was associating and eating with, with these tax collectors and sinners, the Pharisees saw this and they grumbled. And they said, this man receives sinners and eats with them. They just could not believe it. And so Jesus, what does he do? He tells them a parable. He tells them the parable about the lost son or the prodigal son. And with this parable, Jesus is going to reveal to them the heart of God, who is a God who goes after lost people. So, in the story of the prodigal son, maybe you know this, maybe you don't. I tell, I'll tell it to you, those of you who don't. In the story of the prodigal son, the father in the story represents God. The younger brother in the story represents the tax collectors and sinners that Jesus is eating with. And the older brother in the story represents the Pharisees who Jesus is telling the story to at this point. So he begins the story. He says that the younger son takes all his father's money and he goes off into the Gentile pagan world and he wastes it all on a sinful living. He's out of money. He's about ready to starve to death. He comes home to his father. Now his father has been waiting for him, watching for him, hoping he would come home. So the father sees him coming, overcome with joy. He runs to his son. He grabs him. He hugs him. He kisses him. He puts his best clothes on him. And he says, come home. We're going to throw a party. And the father throws him a party. Now, the older brother comes home. He hears the party going on. And he asks the servant, hey, what's going on? And the servant tells him what's going on. And the older brother is immediately mad. He's immediately upset. Father comes out to invite the older brother into the party. And what does the older brother say? He said, I've served you all these years. I have never disobeyed your command. And this son of yours takes all your money. He goes out and wastes it on sinful living. He comes home and you throw him a party. You never throw me a party. He says, this is nothing to celebrate. I will not celebrate with you. Basically, that's what he says. And he walks off. And what does the father say to the son? He goes out to the son. And he says, son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. It was well that we celebrate and be glad. This your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And that's how the parable ends. Unresolved with the father going out to the pouting son or the Pharisee. Back to Jonah now. What happens? Jonah goes out to, the, I mean, God goes out to the Ninevites. He has mercy on the Ninevites. Shows them mercy. And what does Jonah do? He goes out of the city. He doesn't want anything to do with what God is doing. He wants nothing to do with God's mercy and compassion towards these people. He goes out. He says, I'm not going to be part of this party. And as we'll see how the book of Jonah ends, unresolved as well, with the father going out to his sulking, emotional, childish prophet, trying to reason with him, trying to bring him back to reason. So that's where we're at. Let's jump in. Verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. What displeased Jonah exceedingly that he was angry? Well, we saw last week that God told the Ninevites that if they did not repent of their sin and turn from their sin, he was going to judge them. So what did the Ninevites do? They repented and turned from their sin, and God said, I'm not going to judge you then. I turned from that. So now Jonah is angry that the Lord is not angry. Jonah is nothing like the Lord. I mean, what happened? I thought Jonah had a come to Jesus moment inside the fish. Don't you remember? I mean, he was worshiping. He was praising the Lord. He was saying, he was praising, he was praying truths back to the Lord. And then he obeyed God and went to Nineveh. And now he is exceedingly angry with God. It doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. But this is what I think has happened. I think Jonah's about to die. He's drowning, gets swallowed by the fish. His life flashes before his eyes. He has a moment of clarity. He calls out to the Lord, and he has a crisis conversion. 
In the moment of crisis, he cries out to the Lord for salvation. But if you remember when we looked at his prayer, if you were here or you can read it yourself in chapter two, his prayer contained nothing of repentance. It contained no confession of sin. Nothing like that. So his conversion, if you will, was shallow. There was no change of his heart. There was only a desire for a change of circumstances. This happens all the time. Maybe it's happened to you. It's happened to me. I was in 2005, I was sitting in prison for the second time, and I was desperate to get out, desperate, desperate to get out. So I turned to religion, right? I started praying. I started reading the Bible, and I started praying prayers to God, promising how good I would be if he would just get me out. Well, eventually what happened? I got out. And you know what my attitude was? Thanks anyways, Lord. We're all worked itself out. And I went right back to what I'd been doing before. Now, what happened? Well, I had a shallow understanding of the gospel. And I grew up in church. And I had a shallow understanding of the gospel. There was no repentance. There was no godly sorrow over my sin. I did not understand that I had violated God's laws and I'd broken his commandments and I deserved hell. There was none of that. My heart remained hard. And I said what I had to. I played the part so that I could get out and I can continue in my sin. And I think that's exactly where we find Jonah. Out of the belly of the fish, his humility is now gone, and he goes right back to his old emotional ways. And he even goes so far as to become critical of God's attributes. We see that in verse 2. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Jonah takes the good qualities of God and turns them into an accusation against God, totally ignoring the fact that if it wasn't for these attributes of God, he would be a dead man. And in his hard-hearted immaturity, Jonah says this. He says, I would rather die than live in a world where the Ninevites receive mercy and not judgment. That's why in verse 3 he says, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And listen to what the Lord says to him in verse 4. Do you do well to be angry? Do you do well to be angry? Now, the obvious answer to this question is no, right? I mean, no one should ever angrily question the Lord when the Lord does something that we don't think he should have done. That's just common sense. We should not do that. But what's painfully clear here is that Jonah has forgotten God's mercy towards him in his disobedience and that he, in fact, deserved to die. Jonah's totally forgotten that. But Jonah is so upset with him, he's so emotional that he won't even be reasonable. He walks away from the city and he does not even answer the Lord. He does not answer God's question. Why is that? I was running over this yesterday with my wife, Destiny, and my eight-year-old daughter. And I was running through it. And we were talking through some of the stuff. And I came to this part about Jonah. And I came to that question, why would Jonah leave and not talk to the Lord? My eight-year-old daughter answered me. She says, I know why. I said, why? She says, because he'd have to admit the truth. I said, that's exactly it. That's exactly why. The Bible is so simple a child can understand it, and yet it's so profound. Jo Jonah does not answer his question because it's going to reveal what kind of person he is. If he says, yes, I have a right to be angry, now he's dug himself in. If he says no, now he's got to humble himself. So that's why Jonah just leaves. He lets his emotions get the best of him, and he heads out. Verse 5, Jonah went out of the city and set to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. That's an amazing verse. Jonah goes out of the city. You would think he would be in the city, ministering to the people, sharing God's word with the people, joyful with the people who had just turned from their sin, had turned to the Lord, had a change of heart. You would think that's where he's at. But no, he goes out of the city, hoping that God will change his mind, sitting there and watching, hoping that God is like him. 
But Jonah should be thankful that God is nothing like him because if God was like him, Jonah would have been dead a long time ago. I don't know if you've ever prayed that prayer to the Lord, but I have. Lord, thank you that you are not like me. Because I come to him week after week after week, Lord, forgive me for this, forgive me for this. If someone did that to me, I would have written them off long ago. Thank God he is not like us. Verse 6 says, Now the Lord appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. What is interesting, this word discomfort here is the same word translated evil in chapter 1 where it talks about there, none of its evil has come up has come up before me and it's also the same word translated disaster in chapter 3 where God turns from the disaster that he was going to do so this hebrew word can be translated evil disaster or discomfort so what we see here Jonah receives the same protection from the plant that the Ninevites had received from God's mercy. And then what God does is he removes that shade or he removes that mercy from Jonah to let him experience his desires on the Ninevites for God to remove his mercy from them. Verse 7 says this, But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. We see here that Jonah, once again, he's a man driven by emotions. And these emotions are all over the place, and they are based on his circumstances. We see that from the beginning, the very beginning of the story. Right? God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh and what does he do? He runs. He hates the Ninevites. I don't want to hear what you have to say, Lord. He runs, covers his ears, and, and runs out. Then he's on the boat, and he would rather die in his disobedience because his emotions get the best of him than be obedient to the Lord. Then he's in the water. He's about to die. God saves him, and he has this emotional, emotionally charged prayer. And then he praises God and worships him and runs to obey him. Now, he, he does what God has called him to do. And now he has a change of heart. And now he wants to die. Jonah is all over the place. I mean, maybe you've experienced this. Maybe you've lived like this. I have lived like this. And this is absolutely exhausting to be controlled by your emotions. Never knowing what's going to happen. Constantly blown about by the winds of change. Knowing, never knowing how you're going to respond to the pressures of your day. No anchor to hold you secure in the storms of life. It's an exhausting way to live. Abraham Hamilton, if you know who he is, he says it, he says it brilliantly. This is what he says. He says, emotions are terrible generals, but they make great foot soldiers. Emotions are good things. They are great things. They are gifts from the Lord. But we cannot let them run our lives. We see that clearly in Jonah here. When our emotions get out of control, we need to go back in our minds to what we know is true about God. What God has said is true about us, and we need to meditate on those things. We need to use our minds to instruct our emotions, not allow our emotions to instruct our minds. We've got things backwards. Now, I know this can be hard to do at first, especially if you've lived your whole life controlled by your emotions. But over time, it will become second nature. And eventually, your life will look less and less like Jonah's. And that's a good thing. Verse 9 says, But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. So God basically asks Jonah the same question he asked them the first time. When God asks you a question, he expects a response. And whether you respond with your words or with your actions, you will respond to the Lord one way or another. Now, this question, no doubt, was meant to make Jonah see the silliness of his death wish. right? It was no doubt meant to awaken in him some humility and repentance for the way that he'd be living. But Jonah won't have any of it. 
because he's still a man who's driven by emotions. And he chooses to lean in and run in and hold on to his childish anger. Now, when, when we go too far in our lives, we may hear the Lord say this to us. Do you do well to be angry? Do you do well to be frustrated, worried, scared? When you hear the Lord say that to you or convict your heart, immediately answer the Lord in humility. Don't dig your heels in and plug your ears and close your eyes and say, yes, 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 like Jonah did. Don't do that. Take it as a mercy from the Lord. Verse 10, And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? We see here God the creator of everything in the universe, the God of heaven and earth who made the sea and the dry land. We see him humbly and lovingly reaching out to one of his creatures, trying to reason with him. And these two people, God and Jonah, could not be more different than each other. We see, just in this chapter alone, we see God's pity for Nineveh and his destruction of the plant. And what is Jonah doing? He's pitying the plant, and he's crying for the destruction of Nineveh. What a contrast between God and Jonah, two totally different people. Now, the name of this series has been called, Called Beyond, Jesus or Jonah. And we've seen some obvious contrast between Jesus and Jonah, and I'd just like to point out a few here um, for your consideration that we've seen through this book. The first one is this. Jonah ran from God's call to go to the Ninevites. That's what Jonah did. But what did Jesus do? He was obedient to his father's call to come into the world. Secondly, Jonah was willing to die in disobedience to save the sailor. Jesus was willing to die in obedience to save the world. Thirdly, Jesus, I mean Jonah, was in the belly of the fish three days because of rebellion. Jesus was in the tomb three days because of his obedience. Fourthly, Jonah went to Nineveh grudgingly. Jesus went to Jerusalem willingly. Number five, Jonah was angry and sad that Nineveh repented and would not receive judgment. Think about that. He's angry and sad that Nineveh repented and would not receive judgment. What did Jesus do? Jesus wept over Jerusalem, who would not believe in him, and who would face judgment. And lastly, Jonah went outside the city to wait for God to judge Nineveh. While Jesus went outside the city to suffer God's judgment himself for the people. What a contrast. What a difference. We clearly see here through this story, through those examples, that Jonah was a man who was driven by emotion. And if we're comparing and contrasting Jesus and Jonah, Jesus was nothing like that. Jesus was driven by love and obedience to the Father. But you know, this world has this picture exactly backwards, doesn't it? This world says the people in this world, well, they're the ones who care more about people. They're the ones who who pity people and compassion have compassion for people and love people. While the God of the Bible is the one who is angry and emotional, just can't wait to judge people and punish people. They have it exactly backwards. And in reality, it's hard to feel anything but pity for people who have that view of the Lord. Because in reality, we're all a lot more like Jonah than we care to admit. And until we can admit that, we're going to remain with the view of God that Jonah had and the world has. One commentator said it like this, With this, I'll close. 
A Jonah lurks in every Christian heart, whispering his insidious message of smug prejudice, empty traditionalism, and exclusive solidarity. I hope we don't look at the prophet Jonah and say, what a sad, pitiful man. I'm so glad I'm not like that. If we do that, I think we've entirely missed the point of this book. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that you are nothing like us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see ourselves in truth, that you would continue to have compassion and pity on us, Lord, and that you would help us to live more like Jesus and less like Jonah, Lord. Lord, I pray that each and every person here, Lord, would leave here today honest with themselves and honest with you, including myself, about who they really resemble more and strive to be more like Jesus. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.